Amen. That prayer was kind of anointed, Raymond. I, I felt that one deep. Well, good morning, y'all. 9 a.m. second 9 a.m. service ever. It's like you might be developing a habit soon. I feel bad for you. You're the early waker uppers, right, on Sunday, but I would totally be at the 9 a.m. service even if I was not didn't have to be here. I'd pick the 9 a.m. for sure. Um, But you get a little bit of slack because your response to my good morning was a little weak. But if you're new here, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors. Um, Or if you just have missed church in the last few weeks on Sunday services, that's okay. But we have been in a series on the letter to the church in Philippi that Paul the Apostle wrote And Raymond referenced this, that explosion of evangelism that took place in the city of Philippi when Paul was trying actually to go to Asia, right? If you remember the story, Acts chapter 16 tells us the story of the birth of the church in Philippi. And all of a sudden he has a vision or a dream, an encounter where someone appears to him and says, come over here and help us to Macedon or Macedonia. And instead of Paul and his companions going eastward towards towards Asia Minor or Asia, Paul instead is redirected west into Europe, really, so that the gospel could reach Rome. And then Paul's desire was to go all the way to Spain, to reach the very what he knew as the ends of the earth in his lifetime. And you know this story where three individuals and their families, in fact, most likely their households, get radically saved in a short amount of time, and they become the foundation or the early pillars of the church in Philippi, right? You remember this story? He goes down to the river. I always think of Chris Farley. I know for some of you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Down to the river. But he goes down to the river because there's no synagogue in the city of Philippi. Why? Why? Because Philippi was known as one of the great Roman cities of of Eastern Europe or Eastern Rome, the Roman Empire at that time, where it was viewed as one of the most patriotic, one of the most nationalistic cities. And why was this important? Is because being a citizen of Rome came with profound benefits and privileges. And so the city of Philippi, the citizens of Philippi, really wanted to preserve their way of Roman life. They wanted to preserve the Roman dream, if we could put it that way. And so they were against any outside forces coming in to the point where most of the cities that Paul would visit had synagogues, but Philippi was one of the cities that didn't have a Jewish synagogue. And so instead of going for some reason, they went down to the river, probably for cleansing or whatever, they went down to the river And they found a group of women primarily who were God-fearers or worshiping God. Most likely Gentiles who were coming into Jewish faith or, or Jewish understanding of who God was. And so in that place, he finds a group of people led by a woman named Lydia, right? And she was a linen, a purple linens dealer, which you might just think purple cloth. No, remember, very wealthy is likely. It took, you know, an ounce of purple die cost more than an ounce of gold likely in that generation and so you're talking about a lady who is dealing high-end luxury items right like gucci right i always call her madam gucci right is what i referred to to lydia as and 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 here's why that's important to me i think sometimes we think the gospel only reaches to the lowest places The truth is the gospel does reach to the lowest places. But I want to blow up this idea for some of us that God then can't actually reach the higher end or the higher strata of society believing that people who have wealth or people who are academics or educated, that somehow God bypasses them always and Lydia stands in the way of that kind of thinking. Some of you think you work for large corporations and you think the CEO of your corporation is beyond the saving arm of God. And I'm telling you today that no one is beyond the saving reach of the arm of God. 
His arm is not too short that it cannot save. Yes, even CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, that's God's desire. That even in the city of Denver, that mayors and governors will have to bow their knee knee to the name of Jesus. And Philippians 2 is going to tell us that one day. But Lydia is the first fruits of who God calls into this family that we call the Church of Philippi. And then soon thereafter, while he's living in, or you know, him and his companions are living in the household of Lydia, she probably had a really nice place, you know, like, you know, it was more like a villa than in a condo or an apartment back then for the wealthy in the, in the city of Philippi, that when he's going along his work or his day, all of a sudden, right, this slave girl, a clairvoyant is what you would know her as, demonized. This demonized slave girl starts to harass and annoy by actually proclaiming that Paul is a servant of God, but it's annoying Paul. And Paul, remember, he turns, not because he's super godly, which I appreciate. Acts 16 tells us he turns because he was greatly annoyed. Thank you very much. He was so annoyed by this demon spirit harassing this girl who is then harassing Paul He says, in the name of Jesus, by a power encounter, right? Not by logic and reasoning, which is the way that Lydia is brought into the kingdom of God, but by a power encounter, this girl is set free. So God doesn't just use power encounters. He uses logic and reasoning, but he also doesn't just use logic and reasoning. He uses power encounters. The ways of God are mysterious. It's fun is what that means. And so all of a sudden, the second person that comes into, or the second group that comes into, is is on the lower end of society. And all of a sudden, we have this boss lady, right? Madame Gucci is what I like to call Lydia, in one side. And then we have this slave girl, this probably trafficked woman. Why? Because her slave handlers are upset with Paul. And they start creating lies about Paul, so that Paul is then thrown in prison for the first time. And you know this, the the Macedonian jailer, right, sends Paul into prison, tortures him, right, most likely whips him, tortures him, all these sorts of things, and then suddenly, right, in the middle of the night, it says, Paul and Silas, they're singing songs to God. Can you imagine being, like, in prison, Wondering what is gonna, my, what is the shape of the future of my life? He's in prison, and Paul, in the middle of the night, they start singing their songs, right? And then what happens? An earthquake shakes the prison, and it shakes all the prison doors open, and the chains fall off, and this Macedonian or Philippian jailer almost is gonna kill himself. Why? Because if he doesn't, his whole family would be put under, potentially. And so because he thought all the prisoners were going to escape, he thought, I just have to kill myself. That's like the the despair level that this jailer finds himself in. And Paul and Silas cry out and say, stop, stop. We're still here. And what does the Philippian jailer ask? Essentially, what must I do to be saved? That's like when the, you know, you're going fishing, we're fishers of men. That's when the fish just jumps into your boat, right? That's like my kind of evangelism that I like. Even then, I'm not that great at it. I've had like, like Mac, the other, you know, Dr. Mac, Dr. Salt, I mean. He was like, oh, I got to take you on the streets with me. I was like, my dentist goes street evangelism? Like, I love this. I'm like, you know, it's like my wife is prophetic evangelism. I'm like, who is this woman? I don't even know her. I'm like, I'm not actually ashamed of the gospel, I promise. But... But, you know, what must I do to be saved? And it says, this is so beautiful to me, because this is what the gospel produces. That very day earlier, that Philippian jailer was torturing and mocking Paul for what he believed and what he proclaimed. And that night it says that the jailer washed the wounds of Paul and Silas. Can you imagine what the jailer was feeling, thinking, I put these wounds on you. And in his heart, he starts to wash the wounds of Paul. 
Something happened and was transformed. And these three in their households formed the foundation of the early church in Philippi, right? And so then Paul, you find he's released from that prison. And that church was, scholars think, established around 50, 52 A.D. And about 10 years later, Paul finds himself in another prison sentence, but this time not in Philippi, but westward towards Rome. Westward, you're west. You know what I'm saying. West towards Rome. And this is his second imprisonment. You know, three imprisonments in total is what most scholars see. But this is his second imprisonment in Rome. Eventually will actually lead to death at some point in Paul's life. But in this second imprisonment, Paul writes a letter to the church in Philippi. And of all of Paul's letters, it's, it's the warmest I would, in fact, you know, sometimes you read Paul and you're like, man, you're so intense. This one, it lacks, you know, I don't know, discipline. And it has this warmth of kindness and affection about it. You know why? Because Paul, while he's writing this letter, is probably seeing Lydia's face. He's probably seeing the slave girl's face. He's probably thinking of the Philippian jailer and their family that was saved by Jesus that night. And it says, with great affection. It says he had great affection in praying for the church in Philippi. Every time he was reminded to pray, it says his heart overflowed, and that's when he prays the great prayer, right? In verses, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he prays that your love would abound still more and more. In all knowledge and deserve, he's praying for the church in Philippi in this sort of way. And then we find, I'm just trying to get you caught up because I'm not moving on from Philippians 2 this week. I was trying, I promise you. I'm trying to move at a healthy pace. I don't think the Holy Spirit wants us moving on from Philippians 2 yet. But you find him, him saying, these chains, these chains, you, you think that this is going to hinder the gospel. But the things that have happened to me, including the chains I find myself in in Rome today, are actually for the furtherance of the gospel. You're thinking, Paul, how? You're going to read later on. It says, the whole Roman guard has now heard the gospel proclaimed. And by the end of Philippians, chapter, in chapter 4, it says, even the household of Caesar greets you in the name of Jesus. Do you realize it's the Caesar who's put him in prison? But there are some of Caesar's household by Paul's imprisonment who've come into the saving knowledge of Jesus. Even the upper echelons of Roman society, they're suddenly brought into the kingdom. Why? Because of Paul's chains. And not, not only that, Paul says, I know that some of you are troubled by people who are preaching, that somehow their preaching is adding to my imprisonment. Who knows how exactly that works? And he says that some of you are bothered because you know that they're doing this for selfish gain and for selfish ambition in their own hearts that they're preaching Christ. And Paul says, I don't care. Can I tell you, some of us need to be delivered of our opinions of other people. When Paul says, I don't care, Christ is preached. Sometimes we have an opinion of somebody else's motivations, and Paul's saying, I don't even need to have an opinion. You know what I can see? Christ being proclaimed. But he doesn't leave it there, right? He says in verse chapter uh, 1, verse 27, we know it's the beginning of this passage where we find ourselves in until Philippians chapter 2, verse 18, really to the end of Philippians chapter 2. And again, I said this last week. I don't know if I said it to this service, but you guys know that your Bible didn't actually come with chapters and verses, right? It didn't have Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 4. It was just one. Some of you didn't know that, I bet. That's okay. That's why I'm here. Anyways, uh, but it definitely and it didn't have verses either, right? It was some guy on a horse and carriage, you know, writing, the, you know, separating the King James Version of the Bible who put the verses down so that we could actually find them easier. But sometimes what's annoying is that the chapter places are in the wrong places and it breaks it up wrong. 
And so what we end up doing is we read paragraphs that are meant to be clumped together and we separate them. And what happens? A text without a context is a pretext. <laughs> Hermeneutics, okay. A text without a context is a pretext. Here's what that means. We can read verses in the Bible and we think, oh, they apply in this way. But then when you take your st a step backwards and you read that verse within context, you realize there's a real place time that Paul, Jesus, whoever's saying those words means something. And we can't strip that of its meaning because we like that it feels better for us this way. Right? Right? So verse 27 becomes the first part of the next part in chapter 1 that we're going to now read into. And I'm just going to read this to you, okay? I didn't give this to, to Corey, sorry. So you're going to actually have to open your phone. Oh, look at you, Corey. But you're going to, anyway, I still want you to look at your Bibles on your phones. I don't care how you do it. I used to fight that, but I'm with you now. Anyways, verse 27 says this. Only let your conduct, polituomai is the Greek word there, right? The, the same root word that we get for politics, right? And I know, keep your politics out of the pulpit. Paul doesn't. He gets up in every part of our lives, and he doesn't even care what you think. May God do that for me one day. Anyways... He says, only let your conduct, and, and politiumai, the reason that word politics is the root word, it's a, the conduct of a citizen of heaven. We're going to know this later. In Philippians chapter 3, he tells us, right, that you are citizens of heaven. And what does a citizen of heaven look like is what Paul is about to lay out here. If you were in Philippi, you know what a citizen of Rome is supposed to look like. And Paul is offering in contrast what a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is supposed to look like. So when you read, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand in one spirit with one mind. And constantly for the next chapter, Paul is going to care about one spirit, one mind. Be like-minded. Have this mind inside of you that Paul is going to fight for the unity of the church, then some of you think that's so boring. But can I tell you, there are places in God that we cannot even reach unless we go together. Paul has such a high view of the local church. And I understand why people don't love the local church and all these sorts of things. It's not a Sunday service. It's a I get all that. But can I just say, Paul doesn't have a low view of the local church. When you read the letter to Philippi, you will realize that Paul has a very high view of the local church. The community of, wow. Amen? One mind striving Together, there's that word again, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And not in any way terrified, a fearlessness is supposed to come upon us by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted, like a gift is the way you're supposed to dis understand this, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, and that's where most of us pastors, we stop. We just want to create that nice country club environment for you to belong by believing and not actually have to move beyond believing into behaving in a certain kind of way. <laughs> But it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to what? To suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So chapter 2, verse 1. And we're, we're going to move through this. We've been in it the last few weeks together. But I, I, just, there, I still think that there's things that the Holy Spirit wants to, to say to us, this church in particular. If you're new here, we're glad you're here. But I do feel like this is... 
This is how the Lord is forming us together in this season as a church body. I know that a lot of times, you know, in the past, and, and this is not bad, this is actually very good, I love this, but we could be defined by the activities of what we're known for, maybe the prayer room, right, as, as the primary activity of the church. So we're a praying church or we're a presence church or whatever we might define that as, as the priority of our church. I actually think the Lord wants to take us deeper into maturity, and he's giving Philippians to us as a gift, not just of the outward activity of the church, but the inward heart of how we're supposed to live together. I promise you, I am trying to press forward into the next chapter, but I promise you the next chapter is not any easier than this chapter. But I am trying to press forward, and I feel disrupted every week as I'm trying to press forward that the Lord has something that he continues to want us to remain in in this passage. And here's what I want you to understand. Following Jesus has very real very real, relational, vocational, even financial, and even physical costs. That's what Philippians chapter 1 is telling us, that there's real cost to following Jesus. And there's this external pressure that the church in Philippi is experiencing as they're choosing to follow Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's this very ex real external pressure. And like, you know, uh, I have a pastor friend sitting in the back there in Texas. Like, COVID did nothing in Texas, right? <laughs> like, didn't disrupt anything. It's like, wonderful. But in Colorado, it was a little different, right? Like, shut down, da-da-da-da-da-da, all these kinds of things. And there was a real external pressure on whether we should meet or not meet and all these sorts of things. But the last few years, there were some external pressures, right, that showed some internal divisions. And that was just like a baby one. It's not even like what the church in Philippi is experiencing. But, but, but it's not just external pressure that, that Paul is writing to the church in Philippi about. He's actually also writing to the church in Philippi about the internal divisions that are starting to form inside of even the great churches like the church in Philippi, which mostly he only has real positive and warm things to say about the church. But he's saying, even in the church of Philippi, I'm hearing of internal divisions within the church, right? It's why we know what in Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, yeah, 2 and 3, he says, I implore Yodia, Yodia is her name, and I implore Sintush. I promise you, I've really studied how to say those words. It takes me as long as like almost everything else. But Yodia and Sintush, I implore you to cease with the conflict that's erupting between you two women. By the way, these are very clear women leaders in the church. Let that bother some of you. But enough that Paul needs to address them but with a letter where he says, Yodia and Sintush, stop the fighting. Why? Because the same gospel that's supposed to live inside of you is supposed to be at work in you. Put aside your divisions. And this is the same way that Paul is going to address this beautifully with wisdom, profound wisdom that Paul has that he's going to read in verse 1. He says, therefore, there's three there therefores. That's how you know these are all connected. But therefore, if there is, and when you read if, it's a rhetorical device that Paul's using. You can say because or since because there is any consolation in Christ, because there is comfort of love, because there is the fellowship or the participation of the Spirit, because you have affection and mercy, the mercy of God, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. 
Can I tell you, to the church in Philippi, that would have been a weird statement. Why? Because the whole first chapter, he's addressing their concern about Paul being caught in prison and how they feel about how Paul must be feel, feeling being caught in prison. And Paul is telling them, my joy has nothing to do with being released from these chains. My joy is that the divisions within your church cease. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And then he says this, let nothing, nothing, that word nothing should get all up in your business. Nothing means nothing. Nothing else. But let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. This word here, selfish ambition, it, it's, it's a word that is sometimes translated as rivalry and most commonly translated as strife. I, I wrote this one down too because I've got to find it here though. Because there's this Greek word, erythia. Okay, erythia. Erythia. Uh, that's how I wrote it down. Erythia, okay. But it, it's the spirit that actually stirs up division and strife. There's a self-centeredness inside of us that doesn't just affect us only, a narcissism, if I can say it this way, that doesn't affect us only, but literally stirs up strife in the rest of the body. And it produces something that Paul is trying to, to war against in the church in Philippi. He's saying, listen, this is not the way or the marks of a healthy church. This is not the marks of what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven. And I think a lot of times what, what people, when they come into the church, instead of getting a taste of what heaven is supposed to feel like, they get the taste of some of the worst of our humanity. And so there's potential. In, in other words, Paul's saying there's potential for gossip and politicking and even taking sides there's potential for, uh, if I can say it this way, a toxic church culture of su a suspicion and backbiting that takes root inside of the church and begins to hurt people. So instead of a portrait of a colony of heaven, people get a picture of the worst parts of our humanity instead. So he's saying, listen, some of you here are pushing your own agendas. At the over the ex or at the expense of others. That's erythia, right? That's this rivalry or this, this strife that's being stirred up. And at the same time, get, let me just say this some, let me just say it this way. If everywhere I go, whether it's the workplace, new relationships, new friendships, I tend to stir up strife, like I tend to stir up drama, you, I, you know, I'm the drama queen or the, the drama llama, whatever you call it. Like, if I'm the drama llama in this situation, you probably should take a look in the mirror and stop blaming everyone else and wonder what is going on inside of me that strife follows me everywhere that I go. If I stir this up and then conceit, which is viewing ourselves as more important. And I'm gonna, I gotta, I gotta move. Ooh, I gotta move here. But, but he says, instead, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. In verse four. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then this becomes the next verse, begins the next five verses or so, six verses, is the center of the whole letter, of the centerpiece of the letter of Philippians. Everything else will orbit before this, around this, after this, still around this. Everything will be pointing us back to this Christ hymn. Either Paul wrote it, most likely not, somebody else most likely wrote it, but it started circulating in the churches of the Roman Empire. He says, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God or a thing to be grasped at, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he did what? He humbled himself. 
Can I tell you, when God chose to reveal to humanity what divinity looks like, he chose to describe what it was as humility. Can I, here's what I mean. God didn't come strutting and say, look at me, worship me. When God says, do you want to know what it means to be divine? Do you want to know what it means when, when nothing is stressful to us, when, when in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are enjoying eternal communion one with another? They had no reason to disrupt that communion except to reveal what God is and who God is and what he's like. How did God choose to disclose or reveal himself is he chose to humble himself. What it means to be God is not to say, look at me, I'm the best, I'm the biggest, I'm the most important, follow after me in this way. Do you know what God chose? He chose to humble himself. This is who God and what God is like. Humility. And so many of us, we, you know, in the Roman Empire, this would have, oh man, sorry for service, I, I can't go too long, but in the Roman Empire, <sighs> I gotta find this. Okay, Gordon Fee says it this way. It's the main commentary I'm looking at as we're looking through the letter to the church in Philippi. But he says this, humility is a uniquely Christian virtue which like the message of the crucified Messiah stands in utter contradiction to the values of the Greco-Roman world which considered humility not a virtue but a shortcoming. Even in our culture, even in our Christian cultures. Humility is often not seen as a virtue, but a shortcoming. That's why some of us, when we hear, look out for the interests of others above yourself, some of you wonder, is that really good? Is that healthy? I wonder what my therapist might say about that. Is that really how I'm supposed to live my life? And it says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Right? He emptied himself, not of divinity. He emptied himself, or what did he empty himself into? Into our humanity. He emptied himself not just into our humanity, but he came and became a servant. That word doulos means without any rights in and of himself. He became obedient then to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, this is the, the, the second therefore that you find, God has also highly exalted him. Why? Because the Father is saying, I'm going to stamp my approval over my son and his choice to humble himself, becoming obedient to the point of death as the thing that I want to see the rest of humanity realize. This is what I exalt. Therefore, God has exalted highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, or the title is better than a name because Jesus was his given name later, but that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth. Even the demons believe that Jesus is Lord, right? James tells, but they shudder. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is a, a reference to Isaiah 45, verse 23, which you would have known if you were a Jew to be a messianic psalm talking about only God. This is actually, man, I'm going to end here. and We're not even going to sing or anything. Sorry. I needed to get here. He says, therefore, this is the third therefore, saying because Jesus... Because of divisions, don't forget about what the conduct that you're supposed to walk in as a citizen of heaven. And because of these things, Jesus revealed himself a certain kind of way. In humility. Because Jesus revealed himself this way, therefore, my beloved 
As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This verse bothers me. Because I know the gospel makes it really clear, I don't work for my salvation. One man, only one man who lived a perfect life, died a perfect death on a cross named Jesus could pay for my sins. I add nothing to that equation. I know that's the gospel. I know that's the good news. Jesus died for our sins. So Paul, why are you messing with our theology saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling? And I think this is, even for those, like, for some of you, this is easy. If you're married, you know what working out your salvation with fear and trembling looks like. People are up in your business all the time. But work out your salvation with fear and trembling is not work out or work for your salvation and be afraid of God and tremble because he can smite you, which is all true, we get that, but that's not what Paul is saying. Some of us, we read that and we grew up in fear-based religious systems, so we're like cowering now and think, I must obey, I must obey, right? He uses four, three four-letter words that we all think are bad words, right? Obey, work, fear. Those are like the worst dirty, you know, dirty words in the church. And Paul says, obey, work, fear. And what is Paul inviting the church in Philippi to is not just into drudgery or some kind of, of, of uh, enslaved type of obedience, but it's the awe of God or the fear of God that Paul is inviting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ into. Can I tell you, we need not just a revival of the love of God or the joy of the Lord, we need a revival of the fear of the Lord in the church of Denver today. We can clap, and I know like, we all want to say we want these things, but can I say that the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, right? Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, is the beginning of knowledge, the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of God. It's just the beginning, the entrance point. But we don't like these words because we think his tone is going to be harsh when actually it's an invitation where he says, if you walk in the fear of the Lord, I'm going to pry your hands off of everything that you think you've wanted and actually give you all of me. That's what he's going to say in the next chapter. All of you for all of me. This is that divine exchange he invites us into. And he says, work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. And I, I can't go on much longer here, but he says this. For it is God who works in you. It's not your effort. The gospel of grace is God does something inside of your life. Just make room for it. I want to make room for you. This is my worship leader. You guys know my worship leader desires. But I want to make room for you. You know, it's like, do whatever you want to. It's not in the room, okay? It's inside of you. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for what? His good pleasure. Then what does he say in verse 14? He says, do nothing, all things, or do nothing without complaining and disputing. Grumbling and complaining. What, Paul, of all the things that you could say, cut it out, stop complaining, stop disputing? Yeah, because we are a people of unclean lips. Jesus wants to set the coal to our lips, to our opinions. I just, you can stand with me. I'm going to end with this. I didn't mean, I'm hesitant to share prophetic things, but a couple of weeks ago, I, I woke up. It's been a while since I, I had this, I dreamed. I'm not going to share all the details. But in the dream, I, I walk out of this, this big house 
And I know, I'm just going to, I know war is coming. Not like real war, but like spiritual war. But nothing inside of me is, is afraid. Because I know the Lord has an invitation for me and for us in this season. And I walk out on this, of this house and, and I see this old man, who, a, a person I knew, who, who represents the, a spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit, if I can say it that way. And we start to have this full-on conversation just in the spirit, without words, but full-on conversation. And I feel that my heart being healed just of the cares of this world starting to grow strangely dim. And he looks me in the eye. He turns and he looks at me at the end of this dream in this conversation. And he's, he looks right at me and I know he wants me to hear this. And he says, when I say better is one day, you say to me than a thousand elsewhere. And I knew what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me. is like, you know, we know Psalm 84. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Thanks, Matt Redman. Thanks, King David, right? Or Korah, sons of Korah. We know these, these verses, and we think, oh, because we're a praying church, oh, it's about the prayer. No, I knew what he was telling to me was, Brian, you have a lot of complaining on your lips. You always think it's better somewhere else, or it's better at another time, maybe in the past, maybe somewhere else. But I'm going to teach you to go to war in this next season. To kill complaining in your soul where Jesus wants to invite us to do all things without complaining or disputing. Can I say, church, this isn't a small issue to have unclean lips in this way. My own heart, I woke up weeping. It was like 3.30 in the morning, I woke my wife up. Because I knew the Holy Spirit was encountering me for a season yet to come, but I also knew he was delivering me of this desire and need to complain. But to walk in humility the way Jesus walked. Jesus had every right to complain. But to do all things without complaining and grumbling, disputing. So when he says, better is one day, we learn to say, than a thousand elsewhere. Why? Because Holy Spirit, you lead me so well. Amen? Amen. We love you, Jesus. There's no one like you. Help us. Send the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You are dismissed.